So yeah, hey, everybody, thanks for joining us today. One of the things that we're committing to doing is we want to make sure we have two webcasts a week. And one of them is this one. This is the anti-cast for anti-siphon. And what we're going to be talking about on these anti-casts are related to not only anti-siphon training, but just kind of bettering yourself and educating you on things that you can do in security to improve your career, improve your skills, improve all that good stuff. So today, one of the things we're going to talk about is something that we have been trying to launch for, I, I actually just looked it up and I'll show you the email, about a year, right? And we had some, some changes happen, some new features that you'll see in play.backdoorsandbreaches.com. So all really cool stuff that you're going to see about how you can run a Backdoors and Breaches campaign when maybe you're not quite as familiar, maybe you're new to security, maybe you don't really feel comfortable trying to just on the fly pull random cards and say, oh yeah, this is the breach and this is how it would work, right? Sometimes that can be difficult and we want this game to be as accessible to people as possible so that they are using it and they are trying it in their organization. So I'm going to share my screen real quick and we are going to talk about a few things. Let me get that shared. And I'm going to try and watch the Discord as well over here with questions, but please make sure you put questions in either the Discord. Uh, are we doing, are we doing questions in just the Discord or are we doing questions in the QA, Q&A as well for Zoom? How would, how would everybody prefer that? I'm going to say, I'm going to say I'm watching Discord. How about that? So I'm going to share my screen here. And just like Velda said, if you're just tuning in, we were talking about a bunch of training that's going on. And the next live training for, uh, for Anti-Siphon is at Wild West Hack and Fest. So please, 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 please go check it out. Not only is it an amazing conference, but we'd love to see you there. We're going to have backdoors and breaches there. We're going to be playing backdoors and breaches. We're going to be doing lots of fun stuff. And by that time, there will be a ton of the guides that we're about to look at today there. So definitely go to wildwesthackandfest.com and check that out. You can check out Joff's classes, all that good stuff, right? So let's move on here. I said we've been trying to do this for a while, and I mean it. So this is an email between Jason and I. And you'll notice this is this is the actual title of the email. Uh, Think about projects, stare lovingly into each other's eyes. So just so you're aware. Outline of BNB scenarios, which has now been changed to campaigns. The date, June 23rd. So almost a year later, we are launching this. And it's to help the community, to help you learn, to help you. <laughs> if you have the right coffee stain, whisper sweet nothings in his, in his ear. Because I mean, he's a handsome man. I can't help it. So it's been about a year. Right. So now we're ready to launch this. But there's a few things we need to talk about before I show you this. Right. We need to talk about why we wanted to do this. So, like I mentioned, uh, you know, people would go to backdoorsandbreaches.com and they would look and they would say, great, uh, here's here's playthrough. Here's Jason running games. Here's a visual guide that I can go through that tells me how to play. And I would suggest if you're just coming here for the first time, you're like, oh, I've heard of Backdoors and Breaches, and this is the first webcast you've attended, I highly recommend you go to www.backdoorsandbreaches.com and read about the card game that was developed here, because we've started working with a bunch of partners as well, Huntress, Dragos, a bunch of other partners to develop decks in their areas of expertise, and they help inform it, they help select some of the cards, they help inform us based on things that they've worked on. So we're really starting to get a bunch of cool decks. And at the end of this, by the way, stick around. At the end of this, when the webcast ends, if you stick around, Jason is going to come back, talk about some of our newest decks, our Huntress decks, changes as well. That I, I think I'll probably talk about some of the changes as well to play.backdoorsandbreaches.com. But he's also going to give you a preview of the cloud security deck developed here in-house with Bo Bullock, his cloud security class, his anti-siphon cloud security class, and just amazing human. Yes, uh, you're going to get to see a preview of that, not even released yet, just sent to the printer. So stick around after the webcast ends if you want to hear more about what's coming. But all that being said, right, you might go here, you might learn the rules and say, yeah, that's great. I really want to prepare for these things, but I am not prepared to go through and have these kind of conversations, especially when an executive is in the room, especially when other IT folks are there and they say, oh, well, that wouldn't fail. I don't care what your dice say. What well, Jason had a, a, a campaign that he, he ran. And after saying this happened and the dice roll happened, he had an, an executive in the room, basically there's silence and they go, well, I disagree. That wouldn't happen. How do you respond to that, right? 
especially if you're coming in cold and you don't know anything about the organization, you don't know anything about the attack you're trying to simulate, you know the cards and the cards have awesome descriptions on them to show you, hey, here's how the card works and here's what can detect it and things like that. But being able to relate it back, and this is something that I do when I run tabletops anywhere and especially for Black Hills, there's a couple rules that I have. One of those rules is everybody in the room has to take part. So if you're there, you're there for a reason. You have to understand, you have to give answers, you have to give questions. If somebody's talking too much, stop. The second, no James Bond and no Jason Bourne scenarios. If you've taken my workshop at Wild West Hack and Fest, uh, Cubicles and Compromises, or Advanced Cubicles and Compromises, I should say, if you've taken that, you've heard me give an entire slide on this. As soon as you give someone who's already maybe a little bit disconnected from security or maybe thinks that this what security does is overkill and it slows down business and it does all these different things that, that don't allow operations to happen, as soon as you present them the scene from the first Mission Impossible where Ethan Hunt is coming down on wires into a safe in CIA headquarters, they go, that's ridiculous. That would never happen. So I'm going to tune out. I'm going to disconnect. I'm not going to take any of the lessons from this and try and learn from them because I think what you're saying is a bunk, right? So you need a way to counter that. You need a way to be able to talk to these executives and say, not only can this happen, but it did happen, right? That's what we're going to be looking at today. So first thing I have to show you is I mentioned that there's going to be some things that we have to go through. I bring a, one, a D20 and have them roll if their idea works or not. I mean, yeah, absolutely. You can totally do that. That is not necessarily a direct uh, thing that Captain David J in Discord said. They bring a D20 and say, oh, you disagree? Roll. Now, to be fair, that same person saying, I disagree, probably isn't, you know, informed about the, the rules of RPG tabletops, right? Roll initiative check, you know, roll, you know, whatever it is. And they're not going to take kindly to that anyway, but I like the idea, especially for people who are playing and understand the game and say, okay, well, I don't think that would work. Cool. Why don't you think it would work? Uh, because of these reasons. Great. Roll the dice. Let's see if you're right. And then you change tactics. But again, that is still something that is hard to improv, right? Until you've done it a lot. So we wanted to build these things to allow you to create pre-built campaigns and run them with your organization. But to enable that, it's easy with the card decks. If you're in person and you can just say, all right, I'm going to pull out this initial compromise. I'm going to pull out this procedure. I'm going to pull out this, you know, whatever, and set it up. That's easy because card decks, you can just touch them and do it. But with the online version, that was a little more difficult until now. So thanks to the lovely gentleman, Richard, who, who worked on this uh, intrepidly with us, and then also many people at Black Hills that worked on this, we now have new features. You may have already noticed them in play.backdoorsandbreaches.com. Now, you'll notice we have the new Huntress deck in there. Fantastic. If you haven't bought that yet or haven't looked at it, uh, Jason's going to be talking a little bit about that. We've got our cloud deck coming out. That'll be integrated in here later. But we're going to be working just inside of the core deck v2.2. This is the most recent version that if you go to a con and you get them uh, from us or you order them from our Spearfish General Store, if you do that, this is what you're going to get. So we're going to go into this deck. And if you've ever been on this website before, you will recognize it immediately as, as having some changes, right? You'll notice some versioning up here about choosing a deck so you can go back. But you will also notice, let me pull my screen up here. There we go. Um, I'm going to move these zoom controls over. They're on the screen that I'm shared on, and that drives me bananas. Um, okay, cool. So here's your your attack scenario, right? Now, right now, I have absolutely no idea what this attack scenario is. It would make it very, very difficult for me to go through and, and talk to it, right? I would have to literally, as the scenario came up and they discovered something, I'd say, oh, yeah, you've got an insider threat and whatnot. We have our solution function down here, which would show you what's under there. And right now, we know it's insider threat, weaponizing Active Directory, DNS and C2, and malicious service. So we have an initial compromise, our pivot and escalate, our C2 and Xfil and our persistence. That's how they're doing it. And of course, right on a webcast, for whatever reason, my mustache is itchy. So I apologize. Anyway, um, so that being said, we've got our solution here, right? One of the things that you can do now, though, 
is you can go through and go to scenario tools and go to custom. And what you get is a builder. And you can go through and select what initial compromise you want. You can select whatever pivot and escalate you want. You can select whatever persistence and you can select the four written procedures. So again, assuming that you're at least a little bit familiar with the game for this webcast, but maybe I should do a little elevator pitch on it in case you're, you're joining new. It won't take a lot of time. Essentially, the way the game is played is you have an attack chain. You have an initial compromise, a pivot and escalate. You have a C2 and Xville, and you have a persistence that you're trying to detect. And as an incident captain, you would start the game by giving them some clue, giving your players a clue, like saying, hey, the SOC called and they said this. The a lawyer's called and they got a demand for the X, what, whatever it may be. Even that, coming up with that, can, can stymie and stumble some people, right? You could always just go with the classic, we got an alert from the SOC, they think there's a breach, we need to look into it. Okay, you know, it's generic, but it, you know, sometimes can feel like it doesn't give credence to the game, right? So you've got this attack chain, you're trying to discover that in 10 moves. Then you've got these down here. I'm going to close these up a little bit so we can see more. I always forget how close I'm starting to show. Nope. Close. Solution. There we go. Okay. Um, we've got our established procedures, often called written procedures as well. These are ones that when you are rolling, because there is dice involved in this game, many of you already know that, but in case you don't, there's a 1d20 involved in this game. Now you can use our beautiful Black Hills dice that have got our, our logo on it, or uh, in the game. There is also a dice roller, or you can use roll a die on, on google.com. But whenever you say, I'm going to try and use memory analysis to discover one of these things, now they wouldn't be flipped over. Now I did this just for the, the webinar. But I'm going to try and use memory analysis to discover one of these things, right? And notice here my malicious service would be discovered by memory analysis. So if I roll an 11 through 20, I'm successful. And we would flip this card over and we would discover it. If I rolled a one through 10, we wouldn't unless it's part of our established procedures in which we get a plus three. Why do we get a plus three to that? Because just like in the real world, there are some things that you are really, really good at. You can do it in your sleep. You can do it remotely. You can do it on a plane. doesn't matter. On a plane, in a train, in a box, with a fox, whatever it is you're going to do, you can do it, right? And you do it effectively basically 100% of the time. These are things your organization does really well and has written down and documented very well so that somebody with a modicum of skills could pick it up and do it. So you get a plus three to that because you're really good at it. So if you roll an eight, that goes to an 11, it passes. And if it would reveal something in the case of memory analysis, it would reveal malicious service. Now, there's a bunch of other rules we could get into. We could get into injects. Uh, but the only other one I really want to mention is cooldowns. As you use a procedure, you have a three turn cooldown. And when you're playing with regular cards, you just kind of flip them. You go one, two, three, and then it's back in action, right? Here, you use these little tokens here to go on top of it to say, okay, memory analysis now is a three turn, uh, turn cooldown. If on my next turn of the 10 turns, uh, I used sim, that would go here, and then I would drag over the two, and now this has got a two, and it would go on and on. That. So this is great. This is awesome. One, this is something that I had wanted for a long time, and I know we had gotten a lot of requests on. So for the, for the team that worked on this, thank you. My my not wearing hat, my bald head is off to you. I, I so we've got this, and now we can go through and we can select a starting condition. We could either do random, right? Or we could do, let me go back here, let's kill this. So go to our scenario tools and I can say, here we go, let's refresh the page. And we'll go to starting condition, custom condition. So I can go through and choose any of these, load them in. And generally the way that I'll play it is I'll load it off screen. I'll take a screenshot of the solution, put it in my notes, and then I will bring this back onto a shared screen because many of us are remote now. And even if we aren't remote, you know, maybe you're in the office, other team members that need to be part of your incident response exercise are. Yeah, no, uh, uh, Broken Mulberry, this is possibly my favorite business because I like storytelling. I'm a talker in general. Uh, if I'm talking, I'm probably happy. If I'm not, I'm probably not. Uh, so with that said, 
you can select those pieces and we're going to actually do that we're actually going to build a scenario and go through it because as I mentioned there's a couple places where people get hung up and one of those places is trying to tie the attack together so let's flip these over right let's say you were doing this and just look at it on the screen now you were the incident captain and at the end you've got to tell a story as to how this happened if you don't have a deep knowledge of incidents and breaches that can sometimes be difficult right you can very generically say well they used a social engineering attack and somehow weaponized active directory and then uh, maybe that was a malware link. I don't know. Um, and then to get data out that malware was was using Twitter as a C2 channel and checking comments, I, I think that would work. Uh, and to maintain persistence, the attacker added a new user. You're just essentially reading off the screen that doesn't provide a lot of context. And that creates challenges. Like I mentioned about the executive might come back and say that would never happen. That wouldn't happen in our organization. So why are you presenting it this way? Or why are you even doing it? Right. And I'm not trying to pick on executives, but frankly, you can always punch up. So pick on executives. Um, never punched out. So with that said, to make this a little better, I've done this many times. And we could say, yeah, they used a social engineering attack where they called into one of our support call centers and said that they had a receipt or they had some sort of portfolio that they needed it's emailed back to them. And this is an example of what they got last time. Or maybe it's a call center for people who do trade work. And they say, yeah, here's a PDF that's got the updated quote on it. Can you can you open it and you know let me know that it works? The client saying it doesn't work. What, there's a hundred different pretexts for that. And if you do that in your organization, it'd be an excellent pretext. Then you say, well, that malware allowed them to connect to our on-prem Active Directory, if you have one. And they've got, they connect to the on-prem Active Directory and they were able to weaponize Active Directory by reviewing it, finding all our resources, finding older systems, older systems that potentially have not been updated because of business needs, uh, old software, they can't support it, whatever it may be, right? So they weaponized Active Directory, they found our old ticketing system that has access to all these APIs that filter data in from our CMDB. And CMDB is our, uh, our tool, our asset management tool, right? Our asset management database. Once they were in that asset management database, they started exfilling data using a Twitter account that was specifically created to have a comments that the actual attacker would put in that are encoded that don't look like anything to Twitter, but the malware knows it as a code to use. And then finally, because they were already in the environment and they were living off the land in Active Directory, they were then able to leverage accounts that they discovered and create new users that they could come back and use later if their access was cut off. For a lot of people, that is not as comfortable. They're trying to learn security. They're trying to use cubicles and compromises to educate other people in the organization. And it's not as comfortable a thing to do. So if you're stuck, trying to put an attack chain together, if you're stuck trying to explain the attack in a way that resonates, you heard me say one piece about they leveraged an old ticketing system. What if the company or organization you're talking to doesn't use an old ticketing system? Then what? It's like, oh, we don't have any old ticketing systems. We use ServiceNow and it's all software as a service. What are, what are you talking about? When you do things like that, you're presenting a scenario that doesn't resonate with the user. Jason has a thing that that, that I uh, blatantly stole from him when he runs exercises. And the, when they end the scenario, the, the tabletop scenario, he will ask the group, is the scenario I just presented viable in your organization? Would it work? And 99% of the time, as a matter of fact, I've never been on a call where they said no. So Jason was talking in pre-show banter about, um, how you always give uh, a point percentage to make it sound accurate. So it's a 97.8% of the time in a study run by Bunk and Bunk Associates, uh, when that happens and you get that most of the time, they say, yeah, no, that absolutely would occur. But if you focused on a scenario that they don't use, I'll give you an example. Uh, for those, uh, Detective Buck, for those who are in the Discord, I want you to tell me, if I said, there are companies that don't take credit cards. Would you agree with me? Yes or no? Companies 
There are companies that don't take credit cards. Yes, yes, yes. Good. Excellent. Yes. Getting lots of yes. See and no. Okay. So lots of yeses, and that is absolutely correct, right? So if I go in to an organization and say, we're going to focus on PCI compliance issues, but they're a large industrial provider that they don't take credit cards in any way. They use net 30, net 60, net 90, which are contractual agreements with companies to receive inventory through a purchase order. And then they have 30, 60, or 90 days based on the agreement to then pay the vendor. And this is all done either through wire transfers or checks or you know bank account uh, integrations, things like that. They don't use credit cards. They don't have consumers that use credit cards. They have no need to process credit cards. And if I start focusing on a credit card breach saying, oh, and they stole credit cards, like, what credit cards? We don't have any credit cards. Why are you talking to me about credit cards? If you're not building something that resonates with them, they're going to ignore all the lessons, right? So you need to do that. So if you're having trouble with that, don't worry. We're about to get to something to help. Explaining, these are the two that really come up a lot. Explaining why a procedure that should have discovered part of the attack chain. So if we pull up this Gmail, Tumblr, and Twitter C2, if we pull that up, you'll see network threat hunting, Zeek, Rita analysis, and firewall log review are the detections in the game that would discover this. So down here, let's grab firewall log review and take a look at it real quick. Firewall log review. So get in your organization, analyze, and understand firewall logs. So if you were to go to play that, and we know from looking at this that it would discover this card. And you go and play it, and the players just kind of fall on their face. They roll a three, right? Now you've got to explain this, which is one of my favorite memes. Task failed successfully. Okay. You ran the process. It worked. The procedure outputted things. It did not output an error, but it found nothing. So explaining on the fly why a procedure that you as the incident captain know would have discovered part of the attack chain can sometimes make people stumble. So as we developed campaigns, we're going to give you answers to that to help guide you based on those procedures. We also need to explain to users why a, I actually jumped to the other thing, but that's okay. Uh, we're, we also need to explain to the incident captains and the players why a successful role wouldn't reveal part of the attack. And we also need to be able to explain why a procedure that should have failed, I'm sorry, sorry should have worked, didn't. So it's two different things, right? So should have failed, should have found it, but didn't, we need to be able to explain. And we also need to explain why something that they assume would have discovered it but isn't listed on here. So they say, hey, uh, we would look at, I don't know, our CASB, our cloud access security broker, because the only people allowed to access Salesforce are through our CASB. Okay, they've got that. But that's not a card we have in this deck. That's not a procedure we played. So if they were to have something like that and they say, well, no, our, this would have caught it. You now need to be able to explain why things that should have caught it would fail. And that could that, that can ties people up. So this is why we wanted to introduce this game to make this, or I'm sorry, these, these campaign functions to make this easier for you because your time is valuable. The company's time is valuable. And when you do get an hour or two hours to sit in a room and just kind of talk about incident response and how you will handle things, you really want it to be valuable. You really want people to go, wow, I really learned something today, or wow, that was fun. I felt like that was something that I would like to do again. So here's the reveal. Uh, if you go over to the ant to anti siphons GitHub, which I'm about to paste in the Discord, uh, if you oh, thank you, somebody beat me to it. Thank you, DFR Jesse. Um, they, uh, I, I created this GitHub repository, and this is backdoors and breaches campaigns. And there's a couple things going on here that we're going to go through. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the first campaign that's published and we're actually going to build it inside of play.backdoorsandbreaches.com. And then I'm going to walk you through the campaign to tell you all the resources that we've created to help to help ban campaign. Oh, maybe. Uh, it, the, I guess it is banned B campaigns. You can't use the, the, the and 
uh, in Discord, and sorry, not Discord, GitHub names. So I was like, oh, I'll just do and, but you know, band B. Band A, we skipped right past it, uh, Gray Omega. So basically what this is, is a layout that will tell you all these scenarios. You notice here, the first scenario we're going to look at is the call came from inside the network. We launched it today. And you'll see some other launch dates. One of the things that we will be doing uh, every Friday for the next foreseeable Fridays, I think we have it scheduled out through, yeah, uh, close to the end of July. We're going to release a new campaign every Friday as part of a video series called the Anti-Siphon Antidote. And on Friday, including this Friday, a video will launch on YouTube that just covers this campaign. It's going to be about a 10-minute video, and you can watch it there, and it will link back to the scenario guides. So today, we're going, to, we're going to look at the call came from inside the network. But this Friday, we will launch another campaign called That's Disputable. And you'll notice there's some things below these, right? These are all based on actual breaches. Remember my rule about no James Bond, no Jason Bourne. These are all campaigns in which we've chosen the cards that are closest to what we know about major breaches in the news and then built you a campaign so you can test using your cards how you might respond to the same breach, right? So. One, so let's actually go in and take a look at this, right? So I'm going to go into the scenario guide for the call came from inside the network. And what you get inside of these guides is a breakdown. And like I said, we're going to load this into the game and then I'm going to talk through some of these pieces. But you get a breakdown of the actual incident the campaign is based on. Like I said, this one was based off the ubiquity breach that happened in January of 2021. And in that ubiquity breach, it is a fascinating breach. It is an insider threat, but it is way more than an insider threat. It was an insider threat with access to their cloud systems. They then tried to ransom Ubiquity. They sent a note to Ubiquity, to their own bosses, and said, I've stolen your data. No, not as them, some you know attack group they made up. They said, I've stolen your data, and you need to pay me 1.9 million in Bitcoin. They didn't bite. They said, we're going to figure this out. Okay. Here's the crazy part. The person who did this was also part of the incident response team. So literally as they're investigating the incident, they are actively trying to steer them away from evidence that might lead them to them, that might lead the team to, to that individual by the name of Nicholas Sparks. So he pled guilty so I can say his name. Um, so that might lead back to them. Plus, they were modifying log files that were delivered from the cloud environment they owned and maintained, which is where they stole the data from. They were modifying those log files so that the incident response team had incorrect data. When they realized that that wouldn't work, that they weren't that they weren't going to get their ransom, they flipped the script and they contacted whistle as a, as a whistleblower. They contacted regulatory agencies and news outlets and said Ubiquity is trying to cover up this massive breach. They don't know what's going on, blah, blah, blah. And this is where most people became aware of the story when Brian Krebs broke the story. So all these campaigns that we're publishing are based on real breaches. Like I said, the next one is going to be based on the Equifax breach that had a vulnerable Apache web server that wasn't patched. So you can imagine kind of how that story is going to go. It's going to be published this Friday. So going back to this, as you go through this guide, what you will find is tags inside here that say what deck the 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 actual guide is associated with. So what, what games are, compa are compatible. Right now, I just have them listed as core 2.2, but would love feedback to say, no, 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 this game is compatible with, you know, Core Deck 2 or even in the original deck if you change this around. And we'll talk about how you can submit feedback here and actually get something cool uh, in a few minutes. So we also display the solution. And this is just a screenshot of the solution that we're going to build inside of play.backdoorsandbreaches.com. So I already told you a little bit about the story. We have an insider threat, our cloud engineer, Nicholas Sparks. We have credential stuffing. And we're going to talk about that in a minute because this was a public news event, but unlike the Equifax breach, where we actually have a congressional report with a deep dive into the incident, we have to make some assumptions 
as to how the attacker might have worked in the ubiquity breach because we don't have privilege to the data from the breach report. So a common insider threat way to pivot and escalate is with credential stuffing. They might have credentials that they know as part of their daily job. They know API credentials. They know passwords for service accounts. They know things like that. They know passwords for dummy or test accounts used for QA, whatever it may be. And they start trying those passwords on other accounts that they might not be associated with. And chances are, just as everyone who's ever worked on a help desk, that certain times of the year, every student's password is season year exclamation point, which is a terrible practice, don't do that. They might have reused passwords, especially if they bulk generated a bunch of accounts for part of a project or something like that. They use those credentials that they fired at these assets to gain other account credentials, and then they use those for the theft. Now, again, do we know that that's true in this ubiquity breach? No. Someone might but I don't, and it, to my knowledge, wasn't published. So we're going to make the assumption that that is one of the things that they used to pivot and escalate inside of the environment. Arguably, they could have just used their own credentials, but that would have been a pretty boneheaded move, considering, be like, look, uh, Nick uh, moved all this data out using his credentials. Maybe we should talk to them. HTTPS is Excel. Any of you who've worked in cloud environments know that, that many of the tools that you're going to use to move data around are just functioning over HTTPS, right? They, they might be tunneled through HTTPS. It might be some sort of file transfer protocol that's tunneled through there. It could be some terminal service that's tunneled through there, but it's still HTTPS, right? So getting the data out of the cloud environment and down to his local host in his apartment was likely done over HTTPS. Again, these are assumptions based on what we know about the attack. And then new user added. This is another one we have to make kind of a really core assumption that a common insider threat attack or attack function is to say that they have privileged access, they do this credential stuffing, they gain other accounts that can create accounts, and then they create brand new accounts with privileges, right? Again, to further distance themselves and obfuscate what they're doing, they're creating more needles for the needle stack. Okay, now we've got this account doing stuff. Let's go look at that. we got this account doing stuff. Let's go look at that, right? Carbon, CC is carbon copy. Yeah, I just looked over at the chat. I have a, I had a manager that was a huge, it still is a huge Apple fanboy. And uh, I love him to death if he's listening, he knows who he is. But um, he would always say care copy care copy. We need to care copy those people. And I guess, and y'all can correct me in the chat, I guess that was Apple nomenclature. I have always, whoever put in here carbon copy, I have always understood it as carbon copy. So just jumping in on that debate for a moment. Anyway, so new user added is a very common way for an insider threat to maintain persistence. They already have privileges. They already understand the environment. They already know what the naming conventions look like so they can create accounts that look and behave similarly to legitimate accounts that might be overlooked all right here's where these become really valuable because this you could probably do on your own this is no big surprise like okay i think this is about right based on what i read but to give you additional help what i've done and what we've done is defined why each of these cards were used. And you kind of heard me go through it already. So everything I just said is defined here. The ubiquity breach was caused by an insider threat. Here's why we chose credential stuffing, which you heard me just explain. Here's why we chose C2, uh, the, the HTTP as, as XFIL. Here's why we chose new user added. This is all listed out. So as an incident captain, when you want to go run this exercise with backdoors and breaches, you can grab this document and read it refresh your mind, get it in your head why these things were chosen so that when someone challenges you with a question or when a bad role happens or something like that, it's all right there and you can build how you're going to run that exercise around it. So procedures that reveal the attack chain. I did this just as an incident captain to say this helps me out a lot because when I'm running a game and I've got my screenshot over here and I'm running the virtual game, I'm constantly having to go back and look to see, okay, they use this procedure. Let me look at all four cards. Is this a procedure that would work? So instead, what I've done is said, okay, here's the, the attack chain. Here are the cards, the procedures that would reveal it. So you know if the player plays UEBA and they roll successfully, they may discover either the initial compromise or the pivot and escalate in the scenario. If they roll 
against cyber deception and they are successful, you know that it would discover the initial compromise and the pivot escalate, so on and so forth on down. In this particular scenario, there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven procedure cards that could potentially reveal part of your attack chain. So that's just to kind of make your life easier. If you're someone who's a little more comfortable with the game, you don't need as much help as what's being presented, just makes it easier for you to run the game. How long has this BNB scenario has been on GitHub? It went live five minutes before I started talking. Uh, coffee stain. So yeah, this is brand new. Um, are slides for this available after the presentation? No, there are no slides. I actually didn't. I was meant to mention this uh, beforehand. Uh, I never do these presentations without slides. It, it kind of feels like skinny dipping to me. It feels very weird. Like I should have a swimsuit on. This is very strange. I have no artifact to send later. I don't know. Um, but the actual webcast will be published as well. And of course, this is available for you now, this, uh, this GitHub. So written procedures. I have another, I'm going to reveal another one of my rules when I design uh, scenarios for backdoors and breaches. One of my other rules is when I give you the four procedures and I choose them and then we don't pull them randomly, I can guarantee you that two of your written procedures will discover nothing. Because one of the things that I want to get the team used to is just because you're really good at something doesn't mean it's going to help. Right. I can be really good at riding a unicycle and the executives are going to be like, that's not extremely helpful right now. Talented, but not very helpful. Right. So sometimes you can be really, really good at something in an organization. You can choose to invest in that technology or that discipline or that knowledge. But it's not going to help you. It's not going to give you that advantage. I will, however, then choose two written procedures that absolutely will discover one of the scenario, uh, discover a card in the attack chain for the scenario, right? Because I do want people to, to see that, hey, when we invest in this, especially if we had a bad role, this could be the thing that saves the organization from going from an incident to a major newsworthy breach, right? So by doing that, the little gameplay design, you can help people understand that, hey, you know, if you had four written procedures that were all going to knock it out of the park, that's a huge advantage, right? It doesn't prepare people for when things go wrong, all right? So for the written procedures for this one, uh, we chose firewall review. And then I explain in the document, we have this document here that in includes why for this scenario is there. And notice that we include why it's relevant to the ubiquity breach. So in this case, firewall review, it was also chosen because during the ubiquity breach, the attacker was discovered because their VPN dropped and the IP of their home address was revealed. That's absolutely true. That's something we know from the news reporting. They were connected, they were doing their ransom communication, they were doing whatever, and an internet hiccup caused their connection to drop. The local machine said, oh, I'll reestablish a connection because I'm a good little TCP IP stack. And it re reset, it connects and the server goes, oh, wait, the session's got a new IP and it happened to be the IP address associated with their home internet. So warrants happened, all that good stuff, right? Now, all of these have that type of example, sometimes where we're guessing, uh, but we're giving a reasonable, contextually accurate reason why these written procedures were chosen. So again, further helps you kind of flush out the context of the game. We also choose ones that don't, that aren't going to work. And we try and give some examples here as well. So like with memory analysis, most of what we know about the ubiquity breach happened in the cloud. It was a, a, a user with privilege access connecting to the cloud, downloading data out of the cloud, right? Memory forensics in cloud technologies, especially when it is a managed service or as a platform as a service or whatnot, you might not even have that available to you. But let's take this a step further. Memory analysis, when malware isn't involved and it is a trusted user that has already has access to your environment and is doing things that they do on a regular basis. Yeah, memory analysis really isn't gonna show you anything. Oh yeah, that service did a thing that it's supposed to do. Okay. And then of course, server analysis, which kind of falls into the same, same genre as what I, what I just explained. Platform as a service, software as a service, all that good stuff. Yeah, I could go through and look at server configuration hardening, and I could look at the server to see what's going on in that platform. But again, if it's a trusted user with privileged access, they're not going to raise any alarm bells, 
So those two are chosen, but they wouldn't actually reveal anything. Checking the time here. So procedure success. I'm not going to go through each one of these. I'm just going to give a couple examples. This is that area where I wanted to give additional feedback to say, okay, these are all the procedures, like I mentioned up here, that would reveal something. So now let's give reasons why they would be successful that are contextually relevant to the breach that the scenario is based off. So UEBA, if the team rolls that, and if they are successful, you as an incident captain can say, great, upon reviewing UEBA alerts, you discover cloud resources that haven't performed any operations previously on cloud storage access, on cloud storage access storage areas where the stolen data resided. So cool. Some behavioral rules in the rules engine detected, wait a minute, these service accounts, they never talk to that storage and suddenly they are. Let's go look at that, right? That's if you have it configured and if you have it looking at cloud services, and we're going to get to that in a minute. Some of the other ones that I really like here are uh, down here, right, where I've got a note, endpoint protection analysis. And some of these we will throw in notes, right, to say, hey, you know, this is this is where we're going a little off script. We're making some assumptions. Um, it's almost like Ian's teaching cybersecurity. It might be helpful for people who want to learn that. Yeah, no, yeah, it's almost like that. Uh, so, yeah, so note. We don't have details about the ubiquity breach as Nicholas Sharp pled guilty and details of the attack are not made public. However, a privileged user leveraging knowledge of the environment to create accounts they can use to avoid detection or re-enter the system if their previous attack vector was closed is common, right? So we can say, hey, endpoint analysis, the incident response team used tools to review systems with IPs seen connecting to data stores where the stolen data resided. The endpoint showed account activity and local logs that revealed part of the attack chain. So again, we're giving you a reason why these things would be successful, right? So you don't just have to go, well, we rolled that and found this thing. Okay, why? This is really valuable when you have executives in the room, by the way. I'm going to, for those of you who have seen me on a webcast before, I have this wall of hats, which are all the hats that you have to wear when you're, when you're doing security, especially as you move up in rank and you're interacting with executives more and whatnot. But you have to throw on kind of your executive hat and your accounting hat and your finance hat, because this is an opportunity during this gameplay to talk about the investments that you've made. And if you have an EDR system, an endpoint protection security analysis tool or endpoint security protection also in an an EDR as well for your endpoint detection, uh, detection and response, if you have something like that and you've invested a lot of money in it, they're expensive, right? You can go back and say, look, here is a real world attack, the ubiquity, ubiquity, blah, 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 ubiquity breach, in which it's possible that having our EDR would be the thing that helps protect us, right? That we would see the attacker doing things on systems where this agent is deployed. That is really valuable because it is a time when they are hearing this during a tabletop exercise that shows that, yes, this is a real world thing. Yes, it does. Oh. One of the other things, you're, you're, you're getting all my secrets. If you ever, like, like uh, I think during pre-show banter, right in the beginning, Jason said, I have like six scenarios I run every time, right? So I'm giving away all my secrets, which is fine. It's what we do here. One of the other things that I like to do with these scenarios is when I have executives in the room and I have an opportunity to make them understand the investments that they've made, I will do that. I will work with those teams to say, tell me about this UEBA tool. Tell me about this endpoint protection tool. How is it deployed? What did it do? How are you using it, right? That will allow people to really understand the investment and what the security team is doing when it's not a breach, when they're not asking for more money, when they're not, when they have got that finance hat on and they are in the incident response exercise, but they are speaking to the finance team. Hey, that thing that we had to fight up and down to get approved, this is the thing that stops this attack that was in the news. And then later when you're asking for different things, they know that you've researched, that you're not asking for it just because you got a nice steak dinner at some big conference and you're like, I don't know, sounds great, million five, you know. You've researched it and you understand the actual real world implications. So. 
these two are very similar by the way if you're playing backdoors and breaches and you're like what's the difference between endpoint protection analysis and security protection analysis the best way to think about it is one endpoint protection analysis is when you're physically at the keyboard you are looking through the system you are trying to discover what's going on with hardening etc the other one endpoint security protection analysis is using tools like an EDR using agents using connections to connect in and using those tools to analyze the system could be one of your major vendors I hate to throw out vendor names but it could be like a CrowdStrike or it could be a Carbon Black or you know something like that all right procedure failures this is where things get a little weird in in the reading uh but I'll explain the nomenclature so procedure failures I give you some general failures because remember there's only like six what was it what did I say nine cards there's only a handful of cards a couple handful of cards that actually reveal something which means there's a bunch of procedures that do nothing that when they play them whether they fail successfully or whether they just plain fail you're gonna have to explain why they didn't find anything so we give you some general reasons why for all the cards that wouldn't provide anything so uh, I'm gonna find the one that's kind of written the weirdest so you understand kind of how these are written remember I had that rule to say contextually accurate right I don't want to present PCI if they don't take credit cards I don't want to talk about remote workers if they don't have remote workers I don't want to do any of this stuff right so these have some variables in them so if you have a procedure that fails that wasn't one of your written procedures it wasn't one of the procedures that would reveal something I should leave it alone just throw it in a corner nobody puts server in a corner no way. anyway um you go through and you say okay that failed I gotta explain why so I'm gonna jump down to and this is again credit to Jason this is something that I, that I stole from him that works really well that when you go in an organization where you don't know the environment if something's gonna fail and you don't have a good reason to say why or the reason that you give might ruffle their feathers and I go well we don't do that we don't take credit cards we don't do this we don't do that we don't have that tool whatever and then suddenly it just sounds unbelievable right he says give me a technical reason why this would fail in your environment give me a financial reason or a financial reason or a political reason or a personnel reason why it would fail so instead of giving them the opportunity to say well that would never work if you've been in the security business long enough you know that one of those four things is probably a reality in the organization your budget got cut uh the agent won't run on those systems uh licensing wasn't purchased uh the deployment took down a business unit and now they don't want to talk they don't want it deployed again right so when you read these I'm like I'm saying I'm gonna go through one or two of them VAR procedure in markdown files you the dollars I wanted to put the dollars on so a markdown file so VAR procedure whatever procedure you're talking about right VAR procedure didn't detect the attack because the agent couldn't be deployed on the OS server laptop endpoint whatever it is right financial VAR procedure didn't work because the budget wasn't approved to expand licensing for the tool or service or project or application to subsidiary office data center branch new location work from home contractors so again you can look at these in advance and kind of fill in the gaps so if you say all right for whatever procedure I pull we I know that we use this tool as a software as a service so I'm going to use service there and I know that we weren't allowed to deploy to the new subsidiary we bought because we're going to rip out all that and do a greenfields initiative and put all that stuff in so we're not going to bother deploying this old tool to that we've all heard stories like that so this would change to uh var procedure didn't work because the budget wasn't approved to expand uh for the service inside of our new subsidiary and that's it and if that's real to you the person running the the campaign it's going to be real to the people on your team that you're presenting this to because they all know oh yeah we did just buy that that business and no it does not have these things configured so other procedure failure reasons so this is the one that answers that question of yeah that procedure should have discovered it but it didn't because your role was bad or you know whatever well, when this in the game because the role was bad <laughs> that's really the only reason uh so taking the same cards that would have discovered something we've given you 
a contextually accurate reason why the thing that would have discovered part of the attack chain would fail. So I'm going to jump down to cyber deception because I really liked the financial reason that I wrote up for this one. So say you played cyber deception and cyber deception should discover credential stuffing or it should discover the inside of threat. So cyber deception, for those again who might be new to the game, is deploying things like honeypots or honey tokens, putting things on the network that are essentially tripwires that are going to look really good to an attacker. They might go, ooh, another system to look at. Cool. They go to look at it and suddenly you get the advanced logging that you need. You basically have in a sandbox and you can observe them. Or, or it's a honey token and it says, hey, this is the home, whatever it may be. There's tons of cyber deception technologies. So uh, we're procedure failures, there we go. All right, so financial, the executive team cut the line item for cyber deception projects. This wasn't just purchasing enterprise tools because many of you go, well, wait, there's open source tools. You can deploy this. Thinks has, and Thinks, by the way, amazing. Um, Thinks has canarytokens.org and I can go get those for free. Well, you know, why, why, why can't I do this? Yeah, that's, purchasing something is only part of the story in most organizations. Funding the project with ours is the other part. Your team's got to have time to go deploy these things and make sense of them and test them. And if the entire project got cut, those hours are off the table. Now, many teams will do the Herculean effort of just doing it anyway. But in reality, that's not always going to be true. If you're maxed out on projects and things that you need to do and low resources, that just slides off the plate because leadership has identified it as something that they don't feel should have those things. And we got about eight minutes left, so I need to hurry through these. Network threat cutting, all of these have an example that is specific. You'll notice some of them are pretty long, right? They give you a lot of context, like this political one. A board member was identified for network threat hunting. That I've seen this happen. A board member was identified as an insider threat by one of the threat hunters. However, this was done in error. The threat hunter was justified in their analysis. They did it right. Everything, it walked like a duck, it looked like a duck, it smelled like a duck, it paid taxes like a duck, whatever, whatever ducks do, right? But the board member took this personally. And yes, you should be envisioning uh, Michael Jordan going, and I took that personally. Um, they took it personally and then wanted a full after action review of how these things are performed before the threat hunters were basically let off the leash again. So because it was an incident, they were given permission to go aggressively hunt again, but it's going to take them a while to find something because they weren't doing it as part of daily operations. So we give you a lot of really good reasons for this stuff. So scrolling through, scrolling through, we get to the actual final part as you're preparing to run this incident, right? And the final part is the start, right? This is the planning. And then we go to the start, right? So we give you an example. Remember how I mentioned at the top of this, you could say like, oh, you got a call from the SOC. Go find out what's going on. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that does start the game, but given everything I've just told you about the ubiquity breach, about the things that are here in this scenario, as an incident captain, you can say, you've received a phone call from your SOC or your legal team or your executive or the company owner, you'll notice I use that same kind of variable format because you might not have a SOC or you might not have a legal team on staff. So choose the one that works. You received a phone call from your SOC. They informed you the company received an email from someone stating they've stolen gigabytes of company secrets. Unless we pay close to 2 million USD in Bitcoin, they will release the data. The email came with pictures showing examples of some of the data the attackers have. This allows you to use some of the other context that's inside of here to fill them in because you know it's a cloud breach, you know it's an insider, so you now know that they would have shared some of that for credence. The email came with pictures showing what the attackers had. Leadership wants the incident response team to determine where we have a breach, if it's legitimate, and how to stop it. And then you would play through the game. At the conclusion of the game, now you have to explain how everything came together. So I, like I gave the example of the random one, would say the attacker was an insider threat with privileged access to the cloud environment. They used credentials they were aware of as part of their responsibilities and attempted using those credentials against other cloud services in a credential stuffing attack. This allowed them to use credentials not linked to them directly to exfiltrate data. At that point, they sent a ransom request by email. They also created new users to re-enter the environment in the event the credentials they used in the stuffing attack were reset. And this is the point where you could ask, like Jason does, and like I do now, would this work 
in your environment. And if you've done this right and you've read everything right and you've kind of massaged it to your team, they're going to go, yeah, yeah, this would work. And then we give you a little bit of to like where uh, it's modeled after the ubiquity breach and where it's not. And then we give you some talking points. So say everyone goes, wow, that was great. I learned a lot. And you say, what were your key takeaways? And they go, oh, well, here's some things that they should think about based on the exam. Do you have UEBA deployed? And do you know when an insider might be doing something they shouldn't? Does your incident response team even know how to handle a ransom note? Think about it. Does your incident response team know what to do if what they're presented with is, we got this ransom note and we think they have data? That's not something you go look for in the logs necessarily. I mean, you can go look at the email logs and see where the email came from, but that's not going to tell you much. You probably need to have your PR team and executives and all that engaged. Then do you have a plan if there's a whistleblower? There's a big news story. What does your PR team and executive team do to address that? Do you have logging turned on for large amounts of data moving in and out of your cloud environment? If you don't, you really should if for no other reason than financial reasons. Most of the time, moving data in and out of a cloud environment, not intra-cloud or inter-cloud, costs actual dollars. So knowing when people are doing that, even if it's just tracking the finances, is valuable. And then do you have firewall logging for connections from your internal networks to your cloud environment? I know many companies are just like, no, we treat that like another data center. Don't do that. Don't. If you don't own it, if you can't shut the whole data center down, it's not yours. So do you have that kind of logging? And then, of course, the references. Here is where you can go to find all the things. To, it's the reading rainbow moment. It's don't take my word for it. Read it in a book. So you can go back and talk to those people. So in the last minute or so here, I want to show you how quick it is then to take this. With all this context, you go in here and you say, all right, what did we have? I'm going to go into my scenario tools, and I'm going to say custom, and I'm going to go Initial compromise, we know that that was a insider threat for the uh, pivot and escalate. Uh, I'm going to use my do, do, do credential stuffing for my persistence. I'm sorry, my C2, I'm going to use uh, HTTPS as XFIL. And for my persistence, I'm going to use new user added. And you'll notice since I already had the cards flipped over, it did that. But if the cards weren't flipped over, they would, they would still be there and you could flip them over and see. But you wouldn't want to because you want to go play the game and then just as easy with procedures uh we know what do we have ueba uh was one of our written procedures um i don't doubt got the the screens minimized but you can see here where we would go through and say here are the written procedures i think it was firewall log review uh endpoint analysis and um uh, i forget what the other one was but uh we'll say uh oh it was the it was the other endpoint that's right um, so we've got those firewall log review, UEBA, those would find something. These other two wouldn't. And now you're ready to play. You've got your guide. You've got everything that you need for that. And you're ready to go. And you have all the context you need to have a really valuable exercise. And you have those learning outcomes, those things at the end that you can go through. Last thing I want to mention as Jason comes back in and we wrap this thing up is we want your help. There's a reason we did this in GitHub, right? So even as we release these campaigns in GitHub, we are going to encourage you to write your own. And a little later today, we'll tweet out in Blue Sky and whatever, all the, all the things, all the socials. We are going to tweet out a link to, I'm um, pulling up the actual piece here, uh, but this is the, where did, where did I lose my mind? There it is. A template that actually in here describes what you want to fill in. So if you have an idea for a campaign and you want to write one, here's a template and you can do a pull request and push it in or do a pull request into this repository. We'll review it. And if it fits in with all the guidance and we don't have any questions and things like that, we'll publish it. We'll give you credit under the author name. And the first five people that actually do this and submit it and get it uh, published uh, I'm going to send a fancy mug. I'm going to put a picture of it uh, online here. And it's a Backdoors and Breaches mug that, that is custom made. And uh, for those of you who have done many incident response exercises, you will probably appreciate 
the block of legal text that exists on the mug, which is the content of this mug is confidential and privileged. Unless you are the intended consumer, you are not to use, process, consume, or consume liquids from this mug. The mug may contain liquids protected by attorney-client privilege or work product doctrine. If you're not the intended consumer, any consumption, sharing, spills, or modification of the content of this mug is prohibited. If you received this beverage in error, please destroy it and notify your server immediately. So uh, if you find that funny and that's something you want, Later today, you're going to have this template online with some guidance, and then check out on Fridays when we're going to start publishing the rest of these wonderful campaigns for you to use, and again, all designed around actual breaches that happened. That's the show, folks. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Jason, how'd we do? That was good. You finished right on time, and uh, this thing that we started in June of 2022 is now an actual reality, so well done. Uh, that's a thingy. I mean, that's, a, that's about the average time to get something up and running. You know, about nine months, we're like, hey, I have an idea. Right. Uh, and, and once we filter through all the rest of the ideas that we've had for many, many months ahead of that, then we finally get to these. Uh, so what I'm going to do is if anyone needs to leave, totally go. It's the end of the webcast. Uh, but I'm going to sneeze real quick. Let's do that. Nope. Gazutentag or something. Nope. It went away, which is the worst. I did not sneeze, even though I needed to. That's that's great. Uh, Ian, can you stop sharing for one second so I, I can share? Absolutely, can stop sharing. I can do that. Uh, this is a sneak peek. It's going to the printer as of today. So we are approving the final thing for the printer. And so, if you're interested, if you like backdoors and breaches, uh, this is the new cloud security deck, which comes with two new procedure cards. The first procedure card is cloud event log analysis, and the next one is permissions audit. So it's the first time we're adding procedure cards in a while because it does create a lot of complexity to create procedure cards because then you're like, are they backwards compatible and all that other stuff. Uh, but I'm going to scroll through these. This is the new cloud security deck, which is going to print today, which will be available in June, but it's going to be available sooner on the free version, the online version of uh, play.backdoorsandbreaches.com. So you'll be able to select these cards once you choose the actual cloud security deck. And once again, I'm just kind of scrolling through these rather fast because I don't want to spend too much time on them because we're going to do a webcast on it with Bo in, I think, September. Uh, so why September? It's because we actually like the cards to be out and being used and then bring uh, someone in to talk about it. Kind of like how Ian said, hey, We've been doing this for the last three or four years, but what about the people who struggle coming up with a scenario or coming up with a second scenario, a third scenario, fourth scenario? So uh, we want to make sure that these are out so that way people have them. Uh, they'll be available physically too in June sometime. Uh, but we, uh, this, this is a good one here, like the old crypto miner. Uh, this one is interesting. So take a look here. It's uh, the, we've like essentially the team left too many resources running. Uh, and the cloud bill came due and everyone's like, oh, crap. Oh, no. So you have to roll the dice to see how many procedure cards you're going to lose for the rest of the session. Like you have to cut budget uh, in order to cut budget. You have to lose some tools and some people potentially to run those tools. And so you might lose some procedures. Uh, and so these are the new cards coming. Hopefully you saw AI hacked into your cloud account. Uh, you offended the sentient AI because you thought it would be funny to tease it. Uh, ask your AI chatbot chat bot of choice to determine if your procedures work or not. No more die rolling theme. AI has your job now. AI is now overlord. Long live AI. Uh, mm -hmm. So that is a card that's coming. Always, always say so, thank you to uh, Alexa or Siri. Yes. Uh, one last thing is uh, we've been working with a team that like reached out to us and said, hey, where's the Spanish version of backdoors and breaches? And we are like, well, since I am not an uh, Spanish speaking person, uh, Espanol, uh, I cannot do that. So they found a team of volunteers to, to translate the backdoors and breaches cards. We're currently in the process of that. And we have someone on our team that is a Spanish speaking native. Uh, so they're going to be going through and making sure that all the words are correct because I can't proof it myself. And so we're going to be proofing that and sending it off to the printer and uh, producing a limited amount of Spanish speaking decks, but it will be available online. And we are working on, uh, we just finished the Huntress deck. Next is the Red Canary deck. They came out with some great new cards and we're working with another team that is un 
uh, unmentioned as of now for another expansion deck and then potentially another company in uh, early 2024. So we have a lot of new cards coming. And as Ian is showing, like there's a lot of things that we're doing with it. And we would love your help. And so if you like backdoors and breaches, if you think it's a great tool to teach people cybersecurity and do tabletop exercises, please, please, please uh, share your favorite scenarios with us so that way we can share them with others and then that more and more people can do this. Ian, any final thoughts today? No, just looking forward to people using it and letting us know what's going on. And again, because it's in GitHub, if you find other resources or changes or things like that, you can always make a pull request. And we're really hoping that people will, you know, leverage it. And whether it be the ones that we've written or ones that you decide, hey, I'd love to see, you know, this thing. So I'm going to go write it. Be the, be the Backdoors and Breaches campaign you want to see in the world. All right. That's it for us. Uh, we hope to see you next week for another anti-siphon webcast and tomorrow for a Black Hills webcast with Kelly Tarala, uh, where we're going to talk about GRC, which made us think about GRC. And so I think we're going to have the GR chameleon. So it's going to be like a green shirt with a chameleon on it. And so that way you can have your own in case you're in compliance and GRC. So that way you can have your shirt that identifies your team, just like the rest of us have our own shirts that identify our teams. And that's it. Kill it, Ryan. Kill it. With fire. Kill it with fire. fire. Kill it with fire. Fire. Kill it. Fire.